ending with um, we end on. That's it. We do, and then we start doing our hypotheticals for extra credit. So I don't want to keep as much fun. I'd like to be able to get through all of our quizzes for the end of next week. Okay, where did we lose the And what is the major theory behind trademark law? Yes, yeah, to protect the consumer from confusion in the marketplace. Um, you should know that, remember on one of the first days of class, we talked about the different jurisdictions, jurisdiction being two different things. What were those? So geological and So area of the law yeah. and geography. Okay. Uh, so where it happened and the type of law. Copyright is handled in, uh, in its entirety by federal law. So the federal courts go under copyright. Trademark, however, can be either state or federal, depending upon um, the nature of, of the um, case. Okay. What can be trademarked? Things like logos, slogans, the name of a company, etc. There are a few. There are a few general um, rules that must be followed. It must be used in commerce. It has to be used in a business in a business environment where you are, you are trying to sell something. And it has to be distinctive. It has to be somewhat unique. Generic terms may not be trademarked. What's a generic term? Kleenex. Well, Kleenex actually is a registered trademark of Kimberly Clark, although they try very, very hard. If you look in most publications that are geared toward journals, it's like the Quill or, or those put out by SPJ. Professional <coughs> you will see ads by companies like Kimberly Clark reminding journalists not to use Kleenex in a generic sense. Okay. I was going to say like uh, baking soda. Baking soda, yeah, that's generic. It's the brand um, that you would have. And companies work very hard to ensure, and they go after people. You know, who infringe upon, and that's, that's what is called infringement of trademark. Infringement occurs when similar or identical marks are used to identify similar or related kinds of products or services. Sure. Infringement occurs when similar or identical marks are used to, to identify <coughs> similar or related kinds of products or services. What does that mean? Like if I opened up a store and then named it Bullseye and used a logo that looked like Target. Exactly. Now, what if you ran an archery store yeah. and you used the bullseye? Would you be okay there? Give it another ring. Give it another ring. It can't look exactly like targets, right. like but it can be like a different color. A different color, slightly different. The idea is your archery range. Unless it's an archery range, no one's going to be confused in the marketplace that Target is sponsoring this mm -hmm. this archery. You can also have different, um, even the names of the products. We have a Delta Airlines and we have Delta Fosses. Does that mean that you can't use that name Delta? No. There's very little risk that people are going to be confused that the airline is now making Fosses or vice versa. Yeah. So your previous statement about how it applies only when there's like other similar stuff in the market? Yes. So a similar mark, 
or the same or the same mark used for basically the same area of commerce or a similar area of commerce. Again, the whole idea is not to punish people who come up with an interesting uh, trademark, slogan, logo, whatever. The purpose is so that consumers are not confused. Can you think of, yeah, please. So that kind of going back to your Target thing, that was why like you could have Target archery, but not like another Target big box store? Right, okay. right. And a big box store could not use anything even close to what looks like a Target because the, I would feel that they would come in back and say, no, 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 no. This is going to confuse people thinking that, you know, let's say Walmart decided to have another, you know, they have Walmart, Sam's Club, and the no name, but it has a big target on the front of it. They wouldn't allow that. So as long as it's not encroaching on a similar market. Right, right. Okay, has anyone in here been the victim of a, um, of a company's trademark that you thought, oh, I, I, I know this company, I trust this company, but I and then realized it had nothing to do with the established company. That's good. That's good. Um, if anyone has ever seen trademark and trademark infringement is made funny in the movie Coming to America, if anyone has ever seen that, yeah. with McDonald's and McDougal's um, and, the, and the Arches. McDonald's lawyers out there taking pictures. And the McDonald's is one of them. They are, they are tough when it comes to protecting those trademarks. Probably the only company that is more tough, more vicious even. Anyone guess? Walt. Walt, Walt, Walt Disney. The Disney Walt. Corporation. Yeah. They have gone after, if you've seen little mom and pop like daycares, that on the outside draw pictures of a Mickey Mouse or something, they have come in and sued them for yeah. trademark infringement, yes. There was this thing we watched in one of my other classes, uh, media classes, about how like this dude made a bunch of like dirty comics that were like based on uh, drawings from a Walt Disney drawing book. Yeah. And the whole thing was like, they just got sued and like cease and desist into oblivion because but that's the problem. Ultimately, now I don't know this particular case, ultimately, and we're going to get to the idea of parody, can use, and to me that sounds like parody, which is protected. The problem is these massively wealthy corporations can keep suing you until you're non-existent. Because how do you how do you protect yourself against that? Okay. So that's infringement. There's another way that we can break trademark laws. And that is through dilution. What does it mean to dilute something? Water it down. And by watering something down, we do what to it? We make it less of a product, right? Less, less of, what, of whatever it happens to be. I mean, sometimes it's a good thing. We have to dilute certain things. But in this case, it's considered bad. Uh, because it says it's an activity that threatens to weaken the distinctive identity of a well-known mark or otherwise tarnish its reputation. Any activity, such as the creation of a logo, the use of a slogan, anything that threatens to weaken the distinctive identity, or distinctive identity, of a well-known mark or otherwise tarnish its reputation. Well-known marker? Mark, trademark. Okay. Yeah. Threatens to what? Uh, weaken the distinctive identity of a well-known mark or otherwise tarnish its reputation. Okay. That really would have been, had they gone into great depth in coming to America, that would have been an argument against dilution. That MacDougall's and the single arch or whatever they had was in fact weakening the distinctiveness of this double arch from McDonald's. A real life case, how many people in here are familiar? If I just say the word Godiva, what is it? Chocolate. 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 Okay, I wish that someone would have said it's a literary statement that uh, the Godiva was based off of literary figure. It's a chocolate, right? And considered what? A 
high-end chocolate. Right? Mm -hmm. Expensive. A number of years ago, a pet food company came out with what they called Dog Iva and Cat Iva. <laughs> Clever. Clever? Yes. Illegal? Yes. <laughs> they were found guilty of dilution. Could I have a soul of uh, food? Yeah. Is, is this like when the North Face brand and, and their South, South, South Bud? Yep. 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 That's fine. Uh, and in fact, the court said, no, this is not a parody, because what? You are in commerce. You are okay. selling this as a product. It's not art. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was, that was the, the man who started South Butt. That was what he argued. I'm just, I'm just making a parody of North Face. And I said, no, you're not, because you're selling your product. Was you, that Bruce Lewis? Pardon me, it was here. Yeah. I mean, it was, was that Bruce Lewis? Yeah. Okay. Again, as I said, parody, parody is protected. It is recognized by courts as a form of social criticism. However, under parody, the parodist must appropriate no greater amount of the <coughs> original work of work than is reasonably necessary to recall the object of the parody. Okay. So, it's in your book somewhere. I'm reading off of notes. I compiled. You can't make it identical. It should be enough that someone will say, ah, I know what they're making fun of. I know what they're parodying here. But not beyond that. Does that make sense? Can you read the definition again? Sure. Um, parodist must appropriate no greater amount of the original work then it's reasonably necessary to recall the object of parody. This applies not only to trademark, but also applies to copyright. Okay, which we're going to get back to in a second. Yeah. When I was in high school, I worked at a union at a grocery store, and the union used to send us letters that said, like, don't shop at Walmart, and it has a smiley face with a Hitler mustache yep. and a swastika, like, <laughs> yeah, I love, I love that. Uh, yes, number one, it is considered parody, and number two, it nobody would get it confused that Walmart somehow decided to make their um, smiley face look like the leader of the Third Reich. You know, that wouldn't happen. No one would say, "Oh my God, you know, it's a Nazi store that I'm in." No. So it's not similar enough. Yeah, it, it's enough to evoke. Oh, they're making fun of right. Walmart. So like with Weird Al, when he uses like the same music, is just the lyrics being different from the song enough to keep him under parody? Yeah, and in fact, Weird Al actually changes music. I, I know, know very little about music, but changes it enough where his work has always stood up in court. And he's been, he's been sued. Well, what he typically does is just even tuning things like half step down or something. So yeah. it's really just not yeah. exactly. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, I looked into it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, really hard to say that he is not a parodist. I mean, and at heart, that's the most successful ones that people have. Oh, yeah. Without question. Without question. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the show Nathan for You? Yeah. I have. It's, I don't, I don't it's just ridiculous. It's basically a guy that like, goes around the LA area trying to help these like uh, like small businesses like that are like having troubles and tries to help them out. This guy that's running a coffee shop goes in there and is trying to like help them compete with the Starbucks that's around the block. And so he literally creates another store called Dumb Starbucks. <laughs> and it's every every item that a Starbucks has just with the word dumb in front of it and gets away with it uh, for a fair amount of time. And it, it made like national news wow. and they never decided to look at a health inspector and then go through it. So they got shut down because of that and decided just to not do anything with I it. I have a feeling had they not been shut down for that, they would have eventually been forced to I change would think so, the game and all yeah. that. Yeah, yeah they so, got away with yeah. it and made like a pretty oh, decent amount of money. Damn, Viacom. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably fine. Yeah, that's true. Viacom, but yeah. Helps. That's very that's much, very much like the North Face South Bud sort mm -hmm. of thing. They're still making money off of it and they're using the full name. Star oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that, that is a problem. Okay. Um, back to copyright. How long does copyright last? And there's a shaded box in file on page 537 that tells you that. For works 
created after January 1st, 1978. And this is really all that I care that you know is the contemporary work. Congress came in and passed what was called the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act. Um, it wasn't for his work. He was a member of Congress at that time. It was primarily at the um, request of the Disney Company, some of their um, uh, registered trademarks and copyrighted materials getting ready to go outside of, of, of copyright protection. So they extended it. So copyright lasts for the lifetime of the creator plus 70 years. And this is why it is a right that can be passed down like an inheritance. So the lifetime of the creator plus 70 years. Was that date 1978? No, it's just that the Sunny Bono Act of 1981 okay. said anything from 78 forward with this. It used to be 50 years. It used to be the lifetime plus 50 years. Okay. Again, I'm sticking to the essentials and what you would need to know. Nothing you're going to be creating. Unless you have a magic time machine, you're not going to be going back before 1978 and creating it. Yeah. So if the creator dies and then like all, all of his family dies or whatever, does it become fair use after that? Like it falls it falls into the public domain. Which okay. we're talking, not fair use. We're going to talk about that too. But it falls into what's called the public domain. Can they extend that copyright, the family? No, not the family. Okay. No. If you have wealthy friends and you can lobby Congress, as the Disney Corporation did, then you can get the then you can get the laws changed. Because it was 50 years and not 70 years. So if you are the sole creator, it is your lifetime plus 70 years. If you work with somebody else, or with a group of people, and you share copyright protection, it is until the, the death of the last person who owns that copyright, plus 70 years. Now, there are such things as works for hire. Remember we talked about that. You're Many of you in your career will probably have this if you're on the creative side. You'll create something, but you're working for a company who owns a copyright. The company does. That's part of that's part of you working for them. For works for hire, a copyright lasts from the date of when it's been published. And publishing means, however, distribution traditional publishing, whatever, plus 95 years. You say, what's this? That's like this is for works for hire. So you've been paid to create something. You don't own the copyright. Your employer or whoever paid you to do it owns that copyright. For that, it has nothing to do with your life in 70 years. It's just that from the moment that that is published, or distributed, or aired, or whatever it is, from that date, that copyright's gonna last for 95 years. Is there a renewal process in that? There are no renewal processes. Okay, so it's just time. It's just time. And once a copyright expires, it falls into what's called the public domain. Once something is in the public domain, it can be used for any purpose whatsoever that you want. You may, even though you did not write the works of Shakespeare, you may use his work in any way that you want. You just have a, 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 a light bulb going on? Yes. Yes. So many contemporary love stories and such tragedies are built on it. Yeah. Someone had their hand up. Yeah. So I was going to ask, what about works created before 78? 
That was still 95 years for works for hire, but for but instead of the 70, the lifetime in 70, it was a lifetime in 50. So what they did was actually just say, because they were pressured by lobbyists, we're going to extend it by 20 years. Okay. And I don't be shocked when it gets close to that time that they don't go back and lobby again to extend it. Lobby. Although that really does violate the spirit of copyright law and the idea of the public domain. Um, okay, so when you're talking about like this, like, what's it called? The copyright that lasts until like for the works of like 100 years old or something like 95 that. 95 years, 95 yeah. 95 and then become public domain. Like you mentioned Shakespeare, like people can use his work to create what they want. What about like, I don't know, like it seems really, it's so, like I'm a creative writing minor and like, you know, there's people with. David Foster Wallace's book, uh, Infinite Jest, mm -hmm. who like are taking it and page by page are turning it into like an erasure poem page sure. by page, sure. so that work isn't necessarily yeah. like 95 years old, but they're using it to create, is it because they're creating original work from it and titling it Erasing Infinity, or like? What they are doing. You know what they, I mean? I know, what they're doing, they're making a derivative. They are taking something, they actually though, if it is still under copyright protection, mm -hmm. they still have to get permission to do it. Right. The issue becomes then, so they're changing things up a bit, mm -hmm. making it an erasure. <coughs> yeah. Whatever. That's because that, that's called a derivative. They're deriving their work from this other. They still have to, if it's under copyright protection, they have to get permission. So if this work is 95 plus, though, that permission... No longer needed. Awesome. But you have to get it. But then that derivative, you own that. Because mm -hmm. that's your original right. work, even though it's based off of something else. How many people have seen these, what are the remakes of the Jane Eyre books or something where they have vampires, mm -hmm. or Abraham Lincoln story where he's a vampire or whatever? Mm -hmm. Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice, yeah. yeah. And the zombie, yeah. the zombie yeah. apocalypse in the yeah. middle of Pride and Prejudice, yeah. <laughs> oh my word, the poor Bronte sisters. I was just curious because yeah. as soon as you brought up this certain amount yeah. of years, it like related to like something that I'm working yeah. on. I'm like, wait, shit, what am I doing? So there's a whole there's a whole lot of stuff out there. And the idea is that under copyright, of course, what is it, what is the theory behind copyright? You should be able to make money off your ideas, but also the fact that what? It benefits society. Creative works like great literature or pieces of art or music, it benefits society. So you have this mutual um, benefit. It benefits society and you get to make money off it. But there's also the theory behind the public domain, and that is after so long, such great works should just be open and owned by the public for you to do whatever you want to with them. But enough profit has been, it's amazing that we have any law in this country that says enough profit's enough profit. But falling into the public domain it is. Once a trade, trade copyright, excuse me, has been lost to the public domain, it may never be copyrighted again. Once it goes into the public domain, Lose copyright. Yeah. Derivatives can. Derivatives, what will happen is you take that, you make some changes, derivative. You don't own copyright to that original, yeah. but you own copyright to your work. That's your original. Yes. And then another thing about derivatives, does fan fiction fall under Yes, indeed it does. Do you need erotic fan fiction. Do you need yes. permission for that? <laughs> what? Do you need permission for that? Depends on whether or not the original is still under copyright protection. Yeah. So, so Tina would have to go to the Equestronauts, is that my name that right? Yeah. You can tell her to watch this show. And get, because that's still supposedly on air or whatever during her time. So she would have to get copyright permission to be able to use it if she's going to publish her erotic fiction. But her erotic fiction is her own. Okay, I'm gonna stop using the word erotic. <laughs> Titillating anything else in here for a while. Okay. It wasn't in this class, it was in 
ethics, and I said, I think that John Rawls' Veil of Ignorance is titillating, and somebody wrote that several times in the test. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see what else we need to know. We know the duration. Um, know something else, though. We did come in in 19... I don't get it, you know when this happened. It's 1990 Visual Artist Rights Act. It added this idea of moral rights. Which basically says that even if copyright ends, or you sell, because you, you know, copyright is, is part of the marketplace. You can go and sell this stuff. Before his death, who owned most of the music library of the Beatles? Hmm? I, don't, I don't think it was Lennon. No? Michael Jackson? Nope. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. Michael Jackson yeah. bought almost the entire collection. So every time it was played or someone used it as a derivative, he would make money. Not Apple Records, which was the original Apple record company for the Beatles, and not the Beatles themselves. So this is why Beatles stuff has come out more recently, yes. because Michael Jackson's dead there. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, his so his estate <laughs> still controls it. Sure. Um, but but here's, here's what this did. So where do those profits go to then? Whoever controls his estate. Now why doesn't yeah. a Beatle own them? Pardon me? Why doesn't a Beatle own them? Because they sold them. You can buy and sell copyright. Yeah. Just like anything else. They, wanna, they wanted to make money. They made a oh. lot of money off of it. But there was a time, I believe it was either in the 70s or 80s, that they sold it for hundreds of millions of dollars to Michael Jackson. Now, this is like some Silicon Valley shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but what the Moral Rights, the Visual Artist Rights Act of 1990, which I don't care that you know the name of that, but it created this moral rights, which said that no matter who owns it, the original artist always retains the right to be known as the creator. So this would have kept, and I have no knowledge that he ever tried to do it, but you know, let's say that he suddenly changed, you know, let's see the music, let it be. Music and lyrics by Michael Jackson. <laughs> you, know? he, he, you couldn't do that. He could still make the money off it. He could make the profit. But you can't say that this is my creation. I did it. Because we now have what's called moral rights as part of copyright law. So no matter who is the original creator, will always be you known know, as as the creator. They may not. They not may not retain the rights to it in terms of legal rights. Yeah, or get credit or get money, you know. But they will always be able to be known as like as the originator. Okay. What year was that? 1990. But I again, I don't care that you know about that. The Visual Artist Rights Act. It's a very interesting time. But okay. What else do I need to cover on copyright? Public domain. We've talked about facts cannot be copyrighted. Yeah. There is a quiz Thursday. There will be a quiz Thursday. Yes, indeed. Okay. Big time on um, theories behind copyright, theories behind trademark, theories behind public domain. Giving you a heads up on what I. Okay. Oh, we, Cody, you're doing a heads up. Mike, Mike. We can do that. One of the theory. I'm big on that. So you need to know that you need to know for the quiz on Thursday. You definitely need to know things like how long does the copyright last? What happens to it when it goes in the public domain? You need to know the details, but you also need to be able to tell me what is the reason? What is the theory behind us even having copyright law? What is the theory behind trademarks, which we've gone over? Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, one other part before we leave copyright. Fair use. There's such a thing called the fair use doctrine that came out of Congress. From 
from the book, it says, owners of a copyright are granted almost exclusive monopoly over their use of their creations. Talk about, let me give you an example of how much of a monopoly you have if you own copyright. Has anyone ever heard of the late playwright Edward Albee? Has anyone ever heard of the play um, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Of course, that's also a great literary figure. But Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf is a remarkable play about a college professor and his wife who despise each other. And they spend the next couple of hours cussing at each other, calling each other losers, and figuring out ways to not you know, bump each other off or having affairs with other people. It's a feel good romp if there ever was <laughs> Okay, He won, I know he won the Tony when it came out. I believe it actually won the Pulitzer. I may be wrong about that. It is considered one of the 20th century's great works uh, in, in playwriting. Um, so if, if someone wants to, I, they may put it on here. I don't know if some time. But what do they have to do? You have to get permission, right? You have to pay. He was so obsessive about it that he would not let any changes be made in any way. And in fact, one of the most infamous cases, if you will, was a university um, drama department that wanted to put on the play, but using two male characters as though it was a gay relationship which is very interesting because Edward Aldi himself was an openly gay man. And he sued, he said, you will, cannot do that. I own the right to this. George, they were George and Martha, that was the name of the two characters. There's George, and he's a male, and Martha is a female. You may not do this. You may have purchased the rights to perform Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, but I ultimately can tell you how you can do it. And he won, I mean, he, he, he was successful. So, you control a lot. You control who might take and make a derivative work from your original. However, as your book says, this is almost a monopoly. Because there's this thing called fair use. A rule of reason, your book says, to balance the author's right to compensation for his work, on the one hand, against the public's interest in the widest possible dissemination of ideas and information on the other. So it's a balancing test. We need to uphold your property rights, and that's what copyright is, a property right. But there may be an equally compelling public interest in this information, This this product being made public. So they fashioned what's called the fair use doctrine. And it said that for the purposes of criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research, this is on page five, 538 to 539, for those reasons, so again, reasons primarily related to education, nonprofit work, again, you're not making money off of it, it can be fine to use very small portions of what is owned under copyright without infringing or misappropriating that, that copyright protection. And it's based upon certain things that a court would look at. The purpose and the character of the use. So again, a professor who is wanting to use copyrighted material in a classroom where we are hopefully delivering knowledge, that would be much, much more likely 
to pass the fair use doctrine, then I want to put it on someone's backpack and make money off of it by selling it. Is there some sort of like three point Well, there's just questions that you would ask. So you would say, is there what is the purpose and character of the of the use? Although I will tell you that it has become much, much harder even in settings such as this. I can't just take a video that I have and show you. Um, even though I'm not charging you for it, and I think it's educational. It has to be purchased by the university for the purpose of this. And a video that you could go down to um, the Third Reich store and buy for $12 would cost the university 500 uh, or more. It's very expensive. Um, if you've ever had a professor who has copied an entire text, <laughs> um, even if you've had a professor who has copied just a chapter and handed it out to you. She or he is in violation of copyright. That does not fit under fair use because not only it fits the purpose and character, but it violates this idea of the amount. And this again is on 539. They give you four different parts, and I'm skipping the second one. So it might be okay, the purpose of your use, an educational setting, public television, a children, you know, Sesame Street, you're educating. If it's too much, typically, and they're not, they have not quantified it, but for like a book, it's basically a thousand words or less. It's what most courts have said. If it goes above that, and you know, a thousand words, that's not a lot. Is that why, like, on, like, Google Books and stuff, they can only get certain previews of... Yep. Well, there's two reasons. There's copyright, and there's also the idea that they're making money off of selling it, so they're right. only going to pay you so much. Okay. So, in deciding whether or not your use falls under fair use doctrine, they would look at the purpose, the character of your use, they would look at the amount, they would look at the nature of the copyrighted work. Is it something truly conducive to an educational, scientific, artistic um, expression? Or is it just, I want to use something because I want to use it, um, but it doesn't really fit? paraphrasing from the book on here, finally, the effect of its use on the marketplace. So your use of this limited amount of material, copyright material, cannot have an adverse effect on the sales of the original copyright protected material. Here is an example. I decide you all need to have this textbook, but it's not something that's been approved or it's not over there. Suddenly I realize, oh, you really need to have this textbook. It would be great for this class. But it's not in textbook services. We haven't gone through that process. And I make copies, 30 copies for everyone in this class. How does that fit in with this last effect of the work on the marketplace? Well, it's not it's what? It's not the market. Yeah. Well, now instead of like us going and buying it and paying for it, you have it. Free. You wouldn't buy it. Yeah. So they'd say, no, 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 no. You're cheating that author. You're cheating that publishing company. Whatever, because there's no longer a need to buy. It. Travis. This, this marketplace. No. Effective use on the marketplace. Oh. Yeah. So, like in a different context, like say. I mean, I'm in a class right now where we had to buy an outside book and the whole class is based on it. And I need to do a chapter presentation with my group and I don't own the book, but my partner does and they like photocopied it and let me look at it. Is that the same thing? It is. It's, it's basically illegal what, what nice. your partner did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and these publishers that come after them, 
that they find out. It's just like downloading music. Anyone ever been? Oh yeah. <laughs> and you know who they try now to make um, cases of? They kill after college students. I mean, it's no longer, it's no longer, you know, that's just an innocent college student and you know, it's downloading music because you know they're poor, can't afford it. There have been cases where these major, major um, music industry companies have come out and, and like find you. Uh, you know. I got busted by MGM. It was great. Did you really? Yeah, no. My uh, my ISP sent me. Uh, they said it's kind of weird how it works too because they it's more like a warning. They like give a warning. Oh yeah, so you're it's, in it's a cease and desist order. Yeah, yeah, and they're like, if there's anything further, we can uh, you know follow through. With yeah. Actions. They don't reveal your name, like your internet service provider doesn't right. reveal your name. It's just like this right. popped up on your service. So yeah. kind of weird, but it was definitely intimidating. I was like, shit, man, I was just trying to watch. MGM against me. Yeah. 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 That is that is intimidating. Yeah. So again, <coughs> and as time has gone by, I mean, this the fair use doctrine was passed in the 1970s by Congress. And as time has gone by, we have seen it getting tighter and tighter and tighter in terms of, of making it harder and harder for people to use material. Yeah. I think this is kind of outside of the scope of the class, but like in Turkey, copyright law doesn't really exist. Like right. The universities will, or even bookstores, you can go there with a the PDF and they'll print it out and make a book for yeah. you. Yeah. Like, what can publishers in America do about that? It's almost impossible to stop it. Remember, this is all U.S. law. Yeah. Um, there have been problems for years with China, with India, um, pirating music, books, whatever. And of course, it's illegal for them to bring it into this country and, and sell it. But I mean, truthfully, you go down to, I go almost every week to the farmer's market in Sular. Um, and I'll see all these knockoff products of everything. There's no way this is real. I mean, Soulard Market, they have an entire <coughs> Louis Vuitton store in the same, basically. You know, it, you know, and selling handbags for $10. That's not, that's not legit, right? That's illegal. It just depends on whether or not, you know, someone's gonna come after them or not. Yeah. Okay, copyright. That makes sense from theory, the idea of it being the lifeblood of, of industries such as magazines and artistic endeavors, etc. Yeah. So, would you like some of the theory behind copyright is like, it's kind of a, a, like assurance or insurance for artists and creators to make stuff? Yeah, that if you're going to create something, you will make money off. You'll be the one to make money off of it unless you sell it. And the idea behind the, that we do that is because without that incentive, again, this is a capitalist notion, but without that incentive of making money, you, it's all going to dry up. You're not going to do it. And that is to the detriment of society. And I would think everyone would argue that if we didn't have great literature, if we didn't have great music, great art, we would be a lesser society, wouldn't we? and copyright has helped um, to ensure that. Okay. Fair use doctrine, yes. Could you talk about that lifeblood thing you mentioned? Just that idea that without it, everything would dry up because okay. magazines, newspapers, television shows, everything is dependent upon works, you know, intangible works of, of, the, of, the, of the intellect. You know, not a hammer and saw making something. And without the ability to make money on it, like if you build someone a house, you're, or you're a construction company and you build a house, you're gonna be paid for it. That gives you an incentive to continue building more houses. But if it's something that is a product of the mind, you're not going to be able to be protected. You'll, the argument is, the theory is, you're gonna stop doing it. And some people in here said they would continue working for free, but, but that's not, that's not in line with the theory of the way human productivity works. And we have to have incentive and we have to have reward. Carrot and the stick. Carrot and the stick, yes. Okay, so we've gone through um, um, copyright.
copyright, how long it lasts, fair use doctrine, and the difference between that and trademarks. We talked about trademark infringement, trademark dilution. Okay. All right. speech or advertising. And again, if you I apologize if you haven't read this chapter, but you can catch up. And this is if you can't read it, it's not my handwriting. It's not, not English. Have it and tour. This is really the guiding the guiding message, the guiding warning behind advertising for many, 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 many years. Does anyone know the translation to caveat emptor? Something to do with honesty, right? Sort of, yeah. No, it doesn't put the burden on the seller in any way. Oh. The burden is placed on where? Mm-hmm. The buyer. But the buyer beware. It's up to you. Okay. This is the theory that really did color advertising, issues of advertising regulation for a long time in this country's history. And in fact, this theory led to having no regulations whatsoever for a very, very long time. It was simply, if you're going to buy something, it's your responsibility to check into it. You need to, you need to be smart about it. It's nobody else's responsibility. It's not the sellers, and it's certainly not the government's. What do you all think about that? That is awfully sketchy. It is sketchy? Yeah, yeah. I could like make, I don't even know, you could like put a picture online of something and then literally just send them like the box of that thing. Yeah. And be like, oh, you bought the box, you didn't buy this. How many people, I mean, I can't tell you, I can't tell you the tears I shed as a child when I would see something advertised it was going to be in Tricks or Captain Crunch and get the box home and dump it out to my grandmother's disgust, not just dismay, disgust, to find this crappy little toy, excuse my language, that looked nothing, right? What do you think my grandmother said to me? Clean up that cereal? Well, <laughs> after that. After that. You should have known better. Okay. Oh, yeah. Happy I mean, to be fair, though, I don't know. Like, work, I worked in customer service for the longest time, and people would bring, like, the stupidest shit to the desk, like, oh, I had no idea about this. And it literally says it, like, clearly on the box what you're getting. And they're like, oh, my father didn't come with us. I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do to help you. Right. But well, like, return policies now are so lax. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, much completely more than Completely lax. Like, yeah. people can literally <laughs> bring back, like, a bag of grapes that they ate, like, every single grape. But yeah, when, right? literally, I'm not wow. Sam's Club, they will take back well, half-eaten shit, mm. and I'm not even kidding. It's so stupid. Maybe the balance has tipped a little too far in the other direction. I don't know. People are really pampered when it comes to the marketplace. But that's just me. Can I tell you, can I share a story about entitled people and what I did over the weekend that I'm ashamed of? Yeah, <laughs> please, <laughs> please. <laughs> Okay, I was at a restaurant in San Luis for brunch. Yeah. Of course it's brunch. Where? 
and it was packed. And it was about an hour wait, but I've been this one of my favorite places, so I go there. I like Brewster. This is called A Brewster's And they have this tiny, 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 tiny waiting area. So I was standing for good 45 minutes. You're going to have to give me a moral judgment on my behavior after this story. And finally, a family that who were seated in a, in a, on a bench were called, and they went to their table. And this one young woman, who looked to be about your age, plopped down. And as I and other people tried to sit down, she goes, I'm saving them for my girlfriend. <laughs> my girlfriends who have not arrived. She even told this to a father holding a baby. Oh, my. Well, I pushed myself in. I got myself in. Now, one of, okay, so that's one thing. That's one. <laughs> but, now this is the most part. Okay, this is one of my pet peeves. Or, and I know there's some women in here who have long hair. Well, I mean, we were doing her shoulder to shoulder. And she kept doing this. <laughs> and her hair would hit me. Oh, no. And so I kept doing it. Every time that would hit me, I would lean over her and go. I did. Was I wrong? Yes. I was wrong. Where were you? Where were you? My grandma would do just great, as you great. get older, <laughs> as you get older, there's greater license. Oh, that's yeah, true. I know I'm eating a die all the time, but here's another example of what you can do when you get older. Has anyone ever flown and you've been in the middle seat of an airplane? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a musical experience. My my feeling is that <laughs> if you are the poor slob who has to be in the middle seat, those two armrests belong to you. Oh, I agree. Because yeah. they have. Well, yes. And otherwise, you're like this the whole time. So I was on a lengthy flight, middle seat. This older woman had her arm all stretched out, and then this young man had his all stretched out. And, I'm like, and I decided I can't take this. This is out. So I turned to her direction and went, <coughs> <coughs> and she walked, and she walked over. And then all I did to the young man was start rubbing my leg against his. <laughs> oh my God. I got my arm rest. <laughs> Again, judge me if you will. But, you know, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Historically, Courts have classified commercial speech as a form of expression unprotected by the First Amendment, <coughs> leaving it open to the possibility of unlimited regulation or none whatsoever. So for the longest, our courts have said, this is a form of expression that it doesn't even rise to the level of being protected by the First Amendment. Why do you think they would have said that for so long? Yeah? What do you mean by unprotected? Like, like, they, like you could get in trouble for what you said? That it would have no protection, it would have no uh, application whatsoever. Remember right now, what is what do we have right now that is advertised? One of the areas that falls outside of First Amendment protection. False or misleading advertising. False or misleading advertising, right? They would have said, for the longest, they said, it doesn't matter if it's false or misleading. This is not a First Amendment issue in someone's, an advertiser's right to advertise it, nor in someone who thinks they have been hurt to sue. So it could have gone either way. If, it, if the courts have ruled that there's no First Amendment protection whatsoever, and why do you think they would have said that about advertising? Think back about, about Mr. Michael John. What did he think about his theory of, of speech? Michael John? Yeah. 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 What did he think about speech? Yeah, it really was political speech. And the courts and the courts accepted this for a long time. The idea that, you know, this is this is commercial speech. This is just to sell stuff. 
this is not highfalutin expression, right? Like political speech. First Amendment should have nothing to do with this. So by saying that, the courts pretty much opened up that if the government wanted to regulate it, they could do anything they want to. They could ban it all outright. Or if they wanted to say it's totally unregulated, good luck, buyer beware. It could be that way. So it could be like one or the other. They can like super put a bunch of rules on it, or they can just let it go yeah. completely. That's yeah. what that unprotected exactly. means. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And you know, it would be different states. Some would put onerous regulations on advertising. Others would say, have at it. Say anything you want to to sell a product. It's up to the buyer to be aware. It was seen as a form of self-serving expression, not something that was a great contributor to the public discourse, like political speech. possibility of advertising or commercial speech being protected, 1942. Let me tell you a little bit about it. You don't have to know the details of this case at all. A man, again, this was what was happening in the world at this time? World, world, world War. World War II, right? World II. A man purchased a used Navy submarine. <laughs> okay. I can't make these things up, you know? <laughs> Um, and he docked it, and he passed out flyers saying, for a certain fee, 25 cents, whatever, you can come tour it. Well, there was a city ordinance <coughs> that said you are not allowed to distribute commercial leaflets in public. And he sued, saying that he had a right. Think about this now every time someone puts an annoying leaflet underneath your um, white blade. Yeah. Um, eventually the court ruled that in fact streets were a perfectly proper place to communicate information and opinion. However said, it was equally clear that the Constitution imposes no such restraint on government as respects purely commercial advertising. So this was the very first case, Valentine v. Christie's, where the Supreme Court took up the idea of the applicability of First Amendment theory on, and First Amendment rights on advertising, and said two things. The public street where he was handing out these pamphlets was a perfectly legitimate place to do such a thing. Only the Constitution does not protect purely commercial speech. So he was allowed to distribute them? No. Or no. It's an appropriate place for distribution to happen. But there's nothing in the Constitution that protects purely commercial speech. And it was up to the state. Yeah. Yeah. What did they originally um, take up against him for? They fined him. Fined him? Told him he couldn't do it anymore. Okay. And obviously, during wartime, people were interested. You know, it was a time when people would be interested to see what the inside of a submarine looked like. So basically, the citing that streets were a viable marketplace. They, they said that, it, they didn't use the term marketplace. They said it's a viable place for handing out information. So what they're basically saying is that if this had been an ordinance banning someone saying, ban the bomb, or let's not be in war, 
they would probably held that up. But even though, even though, so even so. even though the city had a ban on any kind of leaflet being handed out, they said, no, you know that that area. You're in a public area, public streets. That would be prime area to express your right of free expression. However, not necessarily, or not when it comes to purely commercial products. Yeah. So the Supreme Court said that. They overturned. They did not overturn it. No, oh, okay. no, because it was all because it was a. What it did, it, it still gave no protection. It was just whatsoever. the first time it was acknowledged. First, first time that first the first time the Supreme Court ever took up the idea of advertising having any kind of First Amendment protection. Okay, but they still didn't grant it. They the still didn't grant it, but they did say that it would have been. It is a. It makes a lot of sense. Um, that it's a, that's public streets are a proper place to communicate information and opinion. So had this been a case about political speech, then he would have been fine. He they probably would have overturned um, his fine, hmm. his conviction. But they still said, as late as 1942, now nah, advertising is something completely different. It's just self-serving. So basically, the Supreme Court decided that the that you can't do commercial speech distribution in the streets? No, they just simply said that there's nothing in the Constitution that protects commercial speech whatsoever. Oh, okay. 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 What? My great you know what I'm saying? Like, it feels like they're just like basically this, oh, well, you can't do this, and then. Well, they're saying you couldn't do it if it were a different type of speech. That's facing a lot of hypotheticals. Yeah. So. Really the takeaway is this is the first time the courts looked at the rights, the First Amendment rights of advertising. Yes. So there was no like set precedent really set other than, oh well, you're smart to go into public on a street and try and get information across to people. That's literally what they decided. They're saying that it's an appropriate place to disseminate information. Okay. However, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that that kind of protection has to be extended to advertising. So. What? <laughs> Instead of saying, oh, there's nothing that we can do about it, why don't they just make it? I don't that know. was their ruling. Okay. Is there another thing after this? Like, is there another ruling after this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are several. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But it takes a while. 1964 is the next time the court takes up First Amendment rights of advertising. Yaco Bellas here. No, not Yaco Bellas v. Ohio. No. no, but that was the same year. Very good. But that was about that same time period. But let's, you've, you have been, to, yeah, Cody? Just for context, so like during this time, I mean, from the beginning of the country to at least 64, there was nothing that you could just straight up lie in your advertising? Yes. Oh and you could also be told you may not advertise at all. Yeah. That's unfortunate. <coughs> yeah, because that's when advertising was super like sensationalized and like. Yeah. <coughs> so it could provide, you know, egregious amounts of overregulation, or it could leave people completely vulnerable to script to unscrupulous advertising. Yeah, like a lot of advertisements in the 50s that were directed toward housewives were just like. Oh, sure. Cigarette advertisements, you say, they're healthy for you. Not true. You can see how many ads from the 50s talked about um, which ones doctors mostly recommend, which cigarettes doctors recommend. Sure. I'm sure. I'll be along. All right, what's the name of this one? Sorry. I have a system in my notes. After I told you those two. Horror stories. You have every right to say, "Go, go, go." <laughs> what we do have, however, a case that you have already studied, and I said that it was extremely important in the context of one of our chapters, one of our areas of law. And I said we will, it will come back, and we will see how it was extremely important in another. And it happened in '64. Anyone want to hazard a guess at this case? It's one of these cases that are so important. And believe that it'll be one of the essential 30 questions. Mm. Well, I'll write it down. Well, I'll write it down then. Okay. <laughs> you want? Ooh, wait. Okay.
it was extremely important in another area of our of law and reports. When does it arise? Go back, go back. Yeah, that was 1964. Go back. Even further. 74. Oh, New York Times of Sullivan. Nope. Yeah, New York Times of Sullivan. With public figures. Which, as we know, in terms of defamation law or libel law, did what? They published that full page ad. Yes. But we know that in terms of libel law, it introduced what? As a standard that public Actual features? Actual malice. Actual malice, yeah. okay? So it's, so it's a landmark case for libel. It also is the first time that they took up, because of the fact that it wasn't, it wasn't an, an editorial, it wasn't a news story, what was at the heart of New York Times to Sullivan? An ad, yeah. a political ad. And the precedent that came out of New York Times v. Sullivan, because remember what happened, you have to put all these things together. This is me, if you're interested in being a lawyer, this is the fascinating part of going back and studying all the case law. So what it said was, if you were going, if you were going to be a public, I mean, basically all about um, defamation law, libel law, and saying if you are a public figure or a public official, you must show actual malice. But because it was dealing with expression in the form of an ad, the court also, the precedent that comes out of the court is that political advertising is protected speech under the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. Political advertising, yes. So is that what we're talking, going, didn't we like mention something about I said it will come back. Those and really right. horrible political advertisements on like commercials yeah. and yeah. stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So, you can why. so for the first 1964, I was even alive, and this was the last. So oh, small. Um, <laughs> this is the first time from the beginning of our nation's history that the Supreme Court finally ruled that some form of advertising is protected under the First Amendment. But what they said was political advertising. Because that's what that ad was that had all about Commissioner L.D. Sullivan. That's the precedent, right? Yes. That's, that's the precedent that came out of the New York Times that's important for advertising. And that's why New York Times. So New York Times v. Sullivan provided two huge precedents regarding defamation law with actual malice and regarding First Amendment protection for political advertising. Okay. Questions on that? Will yes. this part that we just started be on the quiz? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. yeah, I think, yes, yeah, that. What was the only president for Malachi was first thing to say? That um, the, that street corners that are a, or City streets are a, an appropriate place for communicating ideas, like through handing out leaflets. Remember that the city ordinance banned all the leaflets being handed out. But then also said, however, because it's advertising, not covered by the First Amendment. For the first time, we now have advertising, albeit political only, covered by the First Amendment. When we come back on Thursday after our quiz, we will turn to court cases in this evolution of advertising commercial speech law that then turn their attention to advertising that is in fact commercial and what kind of First Amendment protection it might have. But where we're leaving off here, for other time, is advertising has First Amendment protection but only if it's a right. Okay, so be prepared for all the copyright, trademark, um, and just this. Month. See you all. Later.